Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight for our latest Ask a Scientist live event. The event tonight is about rewilding, asking the questions, what are the benefits and drawbacks of bringing back wild nature? Now, rewilding is a somewhat controversial approach to restoring nature. Uh, some consider it an essential action to prevent future extinctions. But other worry, others worry about the impacts on wider society or valuable habitats. Uh, should we reintroduce species, including large, large predators? And if so, how will, will they live alongside humans? How will different sectors of society benefit from rewilding or will some lose out? And how does the open-ended rationale of rewilding fit in with more traditional, highly regulated aspects of nature conservation? These may be some of the questions you want to pursue, or I'm sure there are many others as well. Uh, so I'm the uh, moderator tonight. My name's Professor James Bullock, and I'm a member of uh, Ex Extinction Rebellion Scientists. I'm an also a professional ecologist. In my day job, I do a lot of work on restoration ecology. Um, and so hopefully I'm an appropriate person to be hosting tonight. I'm just going to uh, let the panel members introduce themselves in a minute. But before we do that, um, it's probably useful if I give you a definition of rewilding, which you may agree with or disagree with or think about nuances. And actually some of the panel members may want to add nuances in their introductory statements. But the one we're using tonight is that rewilding can be defined as restoration to promote self-regulating complex ecosystems through restoring non-human ecological factors and processes whilst reducing human control and pressures. Um, that may be rather complicated, but hopefully it's, it's a fairly rounded view of what rewilding is seen as. So without further ado, I'm going to let the panel members introduce themselves. So I'm going to pass you over first to Professor Susan Clayton. Thank you, and thank you all for, um, for joining us on this topic. I am a professor of psychology and environmental studies at the College of Worcester in Ohio. My research focuses on the human relationship with the natural world and how that uh, is constructed and interpreted within a social context, how that might be used to encourage environmental conservation. And most recently, I've been looking at um, ways in which climate change will have impacts on human uh, psychological and social well-being. Thanks, Susan. I'll pass you over now to uh, Dr. Kim Ward. Hi there. Yeah, thanks also for having me tonight. Uh, so I'm an environmental social scientist um, and I work at Plymouth University. Um, my research focuses on rewilding, particularly the social and cultural aspects of rewilding, so the impact on society. Um, but more broadly, I'm interested in how rewilding fits in with or might rub against our current uh, political system or the structure of society. So, for example, global capitalism um, and what types of agendas uh, rewilding is being enrolled into as we move forward. So is it an agenda which sees nature as commons or perhaps uh, rewilding as natural capital? And thinking about ways to be critical and push back against those types of agendas as someone as from the social scientists uh, from the social sciences. Great, thanks very much, Kim. And next on to Professor Jens Christian Svenning. Thank you, James. My name is uh, Jens Christian Svenning, and I'm a professor in ecology at Aarhus University in Denmark. And I would characterize myself as a uh, very much a basic science driven by scientists, uh, driven by curiosity about the natural world, in particular biodiversity. Uh, but at the same time, of course, working on biodiversity, uh, it's so eminently clear that we are facing a global environmental crisis in terms of biodiversity loss and climate change. So, so I'm also increasingly, and especially the last 10 years, worked on, on, on doing what I can as a scientist to help society address this uh, massive challenge. Um, I should also say I direct the Center for Biodiversity Dynamics in a Changing World, where we also try our best as a big team to address these questions. 
Many thanks, Jens. And last but not least, Professor Natalie Petarelli. I wish I was a professor. <laughs> didn't oh, well, I've just promoted you. Oh, thank you, James. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just put that, put that on my CV. No. <laughs> I'm Natalie Petrelli. I work at the Zoological Society of London. I'm a conservation biologist. Um, I've been interested in rewilding for some years now, um, and I'm particularly interested in seeing whether it could be a complementary way uh, to bend the, the curve on biodiversity as of to create an alternative approach that may work in some cases to uh, increase biodiversity locally. Um, but uh, I think um, what I'm particularly interested in is uh, trying to see how this could work and what would need to be in place uh, for those uh, approaches to be implemented. Many thanks, Natalie. So um, we'll move on to questions now. So uh, uh, some of you have uh, already posted questions before the meeting, and hopefully you've, you know how to post questions during this meeting, which will be fed to me. So I'm going to go through a first tranche of questions, and this first one will be uh, directed at you, Natalie. Um, I hope people can see me OK, because it seems to be stuck on Natalie now. Good, OK. Um, so Natalie. Um, in my introductory remarks, I mentioned more traditional nature conservation. So a question by Gerard from the Netherlands asks, um, how, do, how has um, more traditional nature conservation approaches been evaluated for success and cost effectiveness in comparison with rewilding? Do we know much about that? No, no, because uh, there's very few cases of true rewilding. And there's, a, as you mentioned in your introduction, just a, a bunch of definition going around as to what rewilding is. So just to categorize a project as to whether they are rewilding or not is, is an operation in itself. But even on the one where there is agreement, there hasn't been much research, especially in terms of uh, how it evolved over time and how it compares to more traditional approach. So this, that's a huge um, um, uh, op opportunity for research to contribute. We know some things, um, um, but um, such as there has been some work on carbon, as far as I remember, it has been also some work on the transition and reorganization, but it's, it's really um, because there's so few cases of rewilding, um, there's, there's not much to learn from for the moment. You, you're on mute. <laughs> Jens, sorry. Jens, you have a comment on that. <laughs> yes, I, I did. just first I want to say I fully agree with Natalie, but I also want to highlight that, I mean, there's, there's of course been done much more work on, on, on evaluating cost effectiveness for, for classical conservation, which of course is a super broad term in itself. But in fact, I know from, for example, for nature management in general in Denmark, classical ways and so on, we really lack uh, monitoring of effects. We really lack baseline data. We really lack uh, just this uh, funding in assessing how the projects work. So, so it's actually a, a broad kind of problem that that activities are not being properly assessed. So in many cases, also for, for more standard approaches, we don't have very good data on how will they work. Many thanks, Jens. So uh, we'll move on to a quite different question, which I think uh, ask Kim. Um, when you think of wild nature, this is, sorry, this is from Christina in the UK. When you think of wild nature, do you envision humans having a place in it? Uh, uh, Christina qualifies this with thinking about whether indigenous people per se or all humans. Uh, yeah, over to you, Kim. Well, um, okay, so that's a, a question that is really relevant to rewilding. So quite often when we think of rewilding, we might think of traditional conservation, for example, wilderness conservation or the rewilding of spectacular landscapes that are void of, of humans. Um, and indeed, I mean, it was worth asking uh, Jens and, and Natalie as well, what do they think of this? Um, because unfortunately, it's one of those narratives that has become embedded within this broader rewilding movement. Um, and really, it harks back to what our understanding of wildness means and this is kind of forms the basis of some of my research. So 
in modern society, we think of wildness as, as something which exists separately from humans. We're not wild. Wildness is out there away from us. And we need to protect that. And if we think of wildness in that way, which is a very modern Western way of understanding wildness, um, then unfortunately rewilding is just going to fall back on those old conservation um, kind of uh, fortresses of protected areas people aren't allowed in or an elite group of people will be allowed in um, it brings up issues of land ownership and equity and access um, but if it, actually if we have a more holistic and relational view of wildness which is very much in aligned with indigenous thinking about what wildness is um, then actually we can think of ourselves as being wild beings as well. Although modern society has perhaps made us feel highly removed from that. And when we think of wildness in this more holistic sense, it's not something which exists outside of us. But indeed, you know, we're very much wild and part of nature ourselves. Then we can start to build rewilding around the idea that we are part of nature. We need to learn to live, adapt, be flexible and flourish with nature. So if we think about wildness in those frames, then creating large scale protected areas uh, might be useful in some ways, but it's kind of not the right answer in terms of learning to live with and uh, adapt to an ever globalizing world. And actually what we need to do is think about everyday living and how we live wild lives with mundane nature all around us all the time. So I think it's really important and I can't actually, I can't emphasize how important it is within the broader rewilding narrative is to start to think about what wildness means and really start to push the idea that wildness isn't something that's separate from humans. It's actually something that we're very, very much part of and need to kind of connect to again. Great. Thanks very much for that, Kim. And it stimulated uh, some other panelists. So I think, Susan, you had your hand up. Yeah, I really want to uh, agree with with everything Kim has just said and, and emphasize that um, it's it's ironic that when you ask people why do they or how do they define wilderness and how do they define nature and why do they value it, they really stress that it should be untouched by human hands in a way that um, they tend to resist, you know, management techniques that involve human intervention, um, and yet. Uh, the result of that is that you perpetuate this distinction between uh, between humans and the rest of the natural world. And in fact, it, it can be it can lead to opposition to rewilding because of the fact that rewilding involves intervention. And then also just to say, yes, there are different ways of, of thinking about the relationship between humans and nature. Um, uh, common in other societies, particularly indigenous societies, some of which do not have, you know, a conception of what is wild with the idea that humans are left out of that. So absolutely, I, I, I hope we can move towards a different definition of the relationship between humans and wilderness. Great, thanks very much, Susan. And Jens, I think you had a comment. Yes, I do. It's a, it's a super interesting and, uh, and very important and also very complicated question. I, I don't fully agree with the previous panelists, but, I, but to a large extent I do nevertheless. But, but I do think I, first of all, I would say people are obviously super central to rewilding. There's nearly 8 billion people on this planet, and there will be even more in the near future. It's the most certain thing we know. Um, and I think nothing will, I mean, I'm a 200% Democrat. I think in the, anything we do should be with support of the people that have to live with the consequences. Uh, so, so people are central to anything we choose to, to do in this world, including rewilding. Um, and also, of course, we don't have any place on earth that's untouched by people. There's been people on all, in all continental ecosystems pretty much for more than 10,000 years, people of our species. Very much. Um, so basically, we don't have untouched wilderness. It's a, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, that said, it's also important to realize that our, our current species are super old. Most of our, our plants and animals go back hundreds of thousands to, to millions of years. Our um, common place, uh, like the English oak or, or, or English yew or, 
or beech or scotch pine or roe deer or all these species, they go back hundreds of thousands of years or more. Actually, the trees I just mentioned, they go back to before the, the start of the ice ages more than two million years ago. So they are really ancient and they aren't adapted to people and they aren't adapted to our cultural landscapes, neither the historical ones or the present day ones. So if you want to understand them, we have to, we, we do have to understand that. Um, so that's just to say it's, and, and then there's also, I'm sorry, I'll do this as quick as I can, but it's, I also think people are, of course, in some ways part of nature, but we're also special. We can do more than most other parts of nature. And so it's also, so I think somehow we have to recognize that we are both part of nature and different. Um, just the last, very last comment, I think it's very useful to distinguish between wildness and wilderness. So wilderness is this idea of untouched uh, big nature, and it, it doesn't exist in the, in the sense of being untouched, but you do have big nature some places in the world. But wildness for me is about not controlling what other species do, basically, or what nature does, also, also the non-living nature. So that's, that's not about people not being there, but it's about not controlling. I'm sorry for being a bit long, but it's a complex question. That's great. Thanks, Jens, and thanks, everyone. Uh, Kim, you wanted to come back on that? Yeah, just to follow up saying, you know, I, I completely agree with the last point. It's not necessarily about, um, it's more about letting nature have autonomy, so have some control um, over what it does. That doesn't mean people need to be removed, but like I said, what it does mean is that we need to find ways to live with nature um, in a way that our society and individually we're just not doing right at the moment. And so it's, it's about finding new ways to live with, adapt, um, and grow with nature. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for that very interesting set of answers. Um, a related issue, which I was going to point uh, towards Susan to start with, is from Valeria in the UK. And she asks, um, nature is known to have beneficial effects on mental health. Do we know are there major differences in the effects on uh, human psychology or psychological well welfare across different environmental practices, such as, say, rewilding versus more traditional conservation versus urban parks, etc.? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say, for the most part, we don't yet have the information in enough detail that most of the people who have looked at uh, exposure to nature and benefits for humans have not really distinguished between different kinds of nature. Um, there are a few studies that uh, suggest that more biodiversity is better, um, which would be nice if, if it were true. I think we need you know, a little bit more evidence before we can conclude that for sure. But there is definitely some evidence that the kind of complexity of the environment um, matters and then greenness um, or maybe blueness, if you wanna talk about oceans. Um, but uh, one thing that's worth recognizing is that people are not good judges of environmental health or ecosystem health for the most part. So they may look out at a landscape and think, oh, this is so beautiful um, and not realize that uh, it's in fact um, a monoculture or you know, very not diverse or that some of the species present in that environment and that ecosystem are actually uh, you know, sick. So, um, yeah, we need more research on this topic, but I think it's important reminder that, you know, that humans do benefit from exposure to nature. Many thanks, Susan. Uh, Jens, you've got an addition to make. Yes. Uh, so first of all, I, I, I would say I've also been done, doing a bit of studies in this, and we actually a couple of years ago did a study on about a one million Danish people where we looked at the exposure or access to, to green space as, as kids and how that affected a range of mental health issues as adults. And it did have very strong, consistent relation on, on the same level as other factors that are known risk factors like, like if parents' mental health uh, uh, state and so on, these kind of factors. So, but I would also say, I think the answer will be very context dependent in terms of whether it's better whether rewilding or other ways of green space will, will, will matter. I, I think for things, things like knowledge will come into play. How do you interpret the green space you see? Um, that will matter a lot. 
also we are we are currently involved in a collaboration with between Aarhus and and Pretoria in South Africa about uh, urban green space and something like safety also comes into place so 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 other, safety relative to other people not to not safety with respect to nature so so it's really context dependent how how you interpret green space and knowledge dependent many thanks Jens so uh yep that's great so um actually a question I was going to target at Jens uh initially is uh from uh, Adam in the UK and he asks um rewilding advocates the use of large free roaming herbivores uh please explain or please describe why this has a positive impact on nature biodiversity greenhouse gas emissions etc as opposed to herds of domestic grazing cows sheep etc yeah that's a that's a good question i mean if you i mean the animals are to some extent the same species so so from that perspective it it it's it's really about how the animals live more than the species like a feral cow which is this essentially the same being as the original aurochs functionally for sure it it is to 99 percent or a domestic cow is super similar functionally so as biologically so it depends on how they live um, and of course in terms of management you can if if you talk domestic animals you can keep them in many different ways what we see for example in denmark when domestic cattle are, are used in nature management which they very often are they are they are, it's still done for for meat production so that means that you have more animals on the area than there would naturally be and they are only out in the summertime where it's productive to have them there they are in stables in the winter and that removes some of the function because one of the things that happen is if cattle are outside living naturally all year round in the winter time they will feed differently on the vegetation and feed more on the on the less you can say nice vegetation like remnant coarse grasses or rushes and the woody plants so that so their function in that sense shifts and then of course there's also about mobility so if you have domestic animals especially if you give them if you give them supplementary feeding as often happens when they're used in, in nature management they get more static and they stay close to where they're fed obviously um, while if they live more naturally they will move much more freely around uh, and and that's that's important for their interaction with the vegetation it's also important for another type of effect that large animals have that are super important and that's dispersal because they ingest various seeds and they also get seeds on their coat on their on their on their coats and and other small animals and so on and disperse these around the landscape plus nutrients of course so the mobility also matters and that's very different from classical we kept livestock versus more naturally living animals cool thanks very much jens uh natalie you had something to add yeah just uh, that uh, I, I think it would be misplaced to think that uh, rewilding is about bringing bringing back big herbivore because <laughs> it's way more complex than that it's about uh making ecosystem work better um, and there's a different way to define how they work better. There's different functions that happen in an ecosystem. And it can't be all reduced to let's bring back big hair before. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thanks for that. I mean, actually, we've had a question uh, from Beck from Australia who asks, please define rewilding in the context of this meeting. Uh, now, I, I did gave that definition at the start, so hopefully people got that, but maybe this is an opportunity to um, talk a bit more about what rewilding is. And one thing is those different activities so, um, that involve rewilding. So uh, since you're, you've are you got the floor, Natalie, maybe you could run us through some and maybe the others could put their hands up if they want to add to that. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, no, no. Um, so um, I think, you know, I, there's different game to play here. I can either try to push my own definition, which I don't think will be useful because we are at the stage where globally, if we want rewilding to work, we're going to need to agree on something. And there has been already a lot of definition. So instead, I'm going to try to focus on what uh, most people agree on, 
Rewilding has a focus on ecosystem and on functioning. So it's about making ecosystem work better one way or another. It has a focus on low management or low to no management. So it has to be about self-sustaining, about those, those species that, that do a bit what they want, which means that there's some form of unpredictability that goes with it. You might set them up on a trajectory, you don't know exactly where it go. You might predict somehow, but you accept that you don't know where you're going with this. And I think with that comes the fact that um, there's, there's a focus on things change. So classical restoration tells you there was this before, um, and then it got degraded, let's just go back over there. Well, rewilding says, well, we might go there, we might not go there because it might not be possible with climate change. And, and there's an acceptance in that, that the biota might just reorganize in ways that is different from before. And that's okay, as long as it's working. And I think these are the ground that most people agree on. After that, there's a lot of variation. Some people put more emphasis on trophic interaction as a way to restore a lot of functioning. Some people go back to way back in history and want to use that as some form of benchmark for defining how um, uh, functioning works and, and some baseline. Some people see rewilding as a way of just doing nothing, which will be passive rewilding, which is you just let things go and you just do nada. And then there's some people that are more about ecological rewilding. So really they see it as a form of uh, restoration of any kind of ecological processes. And then there's a lot of people arguing as to whether it needs big space, small space, whether people should be in, should be out. So there's a lot of variability around that. But I think those three pillars are the way, the way where most people would agree on. Fantastic, Natalie. That was, that's a great summary. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, okay. I'm just, I, I think there are some questions, there are a number of questions of, on related issues. So, um, there's which I'll uh, take the pressure off you, Natalie. I'll, I'll go to Jens, but you may have something to add on this. There's a number of questions from, uh, related questions from Annie. Uh, from Adora um, and from, do, 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 I think there was Emma, yes. So it's more about rewilding on the small scale. Uh, what can we do to maybe rewild small areas of land, maybe our gardens, our local environments, and the issues that we may not have access to large animals for that. Is, is there something that people can do along those lines? Maybe, uh, shall I ask Jens first and Natalie if you want to add, or uh, Kim and Susan as well, of course. Yes, I, I, I think so. Of, of, uh, I pretty much agree with the sort of overall perspective that, that Natalie, Natalie gave. Um, and of course, in terms of achieving self-regulating ecosystems, the smaller the area, the more difficult it will be. So that's so that's so if you if you have your own garden and you try to do it there, it's 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 not big enough that you can really achieve that. But you can be inspired by by the kinds of, of processes and factors that that you would try to restore in bigger areas where you would try to do rewilding. So so that could be that could and and if you can restore the processes, you can at least think about the structures that you would expect. So. So, for example, if it, a garden would also often has the potential to 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 mimic a, a kind of woodland, but then you can try and imagine how what, what would be in a woodland governed by these kind of processes that you would restore with rewilding. That could be the larger herbivores. It could be natural disturbance regimes. It would, of course, be be no harvesting of trees. So you would have in, trees that dying of old age. You would have coarse woody debris. These kind of things. So you can. Take some of that thinking and apply to small areas, and of course you can you can reduce your control to the level that's acceptable for you in your garden. So, because of course rewilding is very much about not controlling the wildness that we talked about. So you can try and make it as wild as is as is, uh, is as as you can, you can say, or as you want. And Natalie, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's, um, there's different things to say. First of all, your garden is not an island. It's connected to other things. So when you promote pollinators in your area, when you leave animals being able to go through it, 
you 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 actually participate in that overall picture of a fragmented biodiversity trying to make a living in your uh, urban environment. So just that is a huge contribution. So whenever you refuse to have plastic grass, which is my my pet, <laughs> pet bear, I really I really don't understand why you would pay to have plastic green grass. But anyway, so when you refuse to do that, when you actually let your plants go, when you let those natives go in and those you know random tree, you're really helping those species that this, this depend on those trees to 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 make a living and survive in your area so just for that it's fantastic so make a pond let things grow etc but i think the other aspect which will probably i'm sure kim and uh, susan will pick on it is that when you do that not only you educate yourself for knowing how to coexist with nature because coexist with nature is not blue and rosy you know you have conf conflict with nature all the time what what animals do what species do is not systematically what you would like them to do and learning to learn to to deal with that is it comes at your doorstep so it, it becomes real when you start to actually implement it and then you become um an example for your neighbors who has been mowing, you know, intensively the grass to have absolutely nothing growing. So, but so if they see something else, the mimicking power of seeing people changing their mindset is quite actually a good thing for enticing community with the concept of rewilding, which is uh, to me a lot about changing that relationship with nature, um, but making it real, practical, not not a fantasy long. Um, and Kim, you should go on this, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Natalie. Kim. Over to you. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with uh, what what Natalie said, and that we've had discussions before about uh, messy back gardens. I mean, this does, it comes down to perceptions, really, and this very ingrained uh, cultural perception of what a garden should look like. It doesn't just, um, it's not just about English gardens, but the English in particular are very tidy people. We like a tidy garden, and we're also conformists. We will conform. There's a lot of pressure for us to mow our lawns and conform to particular ideas of what our own natural space should look like. Um, so I, of course, think one of the things you can do if you want to do rewilding on a small scale is to let your garden grow, um, you know, install a pond and let it go. Don't mow your lawn. But part of that is, unfortunately, that there's going to be pressure from neighbours. My, I have a shared garden and my neighbour cuts her lawn, bless her, she's fantastic, but you know, there, are, there is a conflict there and there will be conflicts and these are, these are very real conflicts, not only that we're having with people, we're going to have with our neighbours, our communities around messiness, death and decay, um, you know, there might be dead trees, there might be kinds of things that aren't aesthetically pleasing that we're going to have to learn to deal with if we want our world to be a little bit wild, wilder. And as Natalie says, if we all did this, then actually it would create a big kind of connectivity, connected map across our urban areas. So I think it's really important. Uh, but this also just brings me on to another quick point, which is about um, something which I think is really important going forward for rewilding is we're at this crossroads period at the moment where we need to think about access and equity in rewilding. And land ownership is a big um, issue that we need to have an open very real conversation about because lots of the organizations or individuals that are rewilding are very rich people um, who have access to land or who are, have access to control over the rewilding narrative and the rewilding practice. And actually we, we do need to use this moment in time to think about where rewilding is going. Rewilding our gardens is great, but how can we find spaces collectively as, as common spaces to rewild rather than this being another elite endeavor. So the small scale is important with gardens, but it's, we need to think as individuals how we now work this narrative up past rewilding as natural capital and start thinking about how we create these rewilding commons. Thanks, Gemma. There are actually there are a couple of questions on the issues you just brought up, which we'll return to a bit later. So that's, that's great. Um, Susan, you've got a comment here. Yeah, and I, I really agree with what Kim was just saying, but I wanted to return to something that Natalie brought up, which is the idea that um, by giving up a little bit of control in our backyards, we, in our, our gardens, we can be learning about uh, establishing a different relationship with the natural world. And one of the things that people talk about as a, as a value of nature, and one of the reasons they, they talk about valuing 
wild nature is the idea of, of learning humility. Um, I think, and this certainly relates back to the class issues that Kim was bringing up, that um, we, we like to be in charge, we like to have control, we like to think that we're the center of the universe. But when people talk about some of the transcendent experiences they have in natural settings, it's um, one of the benefits they describe is that feeling of humility, that there's something out here that's larger than me, that, um, that I don't have control over. So I do think um, it, it's challenging to us to give up that control. And I have you know, big piles of brush and uh, lots of what my neighbors think are weeds in my garden, but, um, but that's part of the process of maybe uh, reconceptualizing our own place with regard to nature. Uh, James, you're muted. Am I still muted? Good. Uh, Jens, over to you. <laughs> just, a, just a quick res response to some of the interesting comments from, from, from Kim and Susan. It's working with landscape architects on, on trying to create more wild uh, urban green space. Here in Aarhus, I learned, I learned a small trick because they are design people in contrast to us biologists. And, and they, they said that's something they call choose to care. So if you want to really bring in space for wildness, messiness, then make sure people can see it's on purpose. So that, that means that you, for example, if you want to not, not mow your lawn, at least make a path or make as that's clear that you made or make a straight line somewhere that shows the boundary to where it's wild and where it's not. That kind of that kind of trick at least uh, helps people see that you do it on purpose and that makes it more socially acceptable, at least in, in countries like also Denmark, which is a, also a very tidy country. So it helps, helps people to see, okay, it's not just that you are lazy or something like that. Yes, the Danes are probably even tidier than the English. So yeah, <laughs> I said English advisedly there. Um, great. Thanks very much for those responses. Um, slightly different question, which I'm going to target initially at Susan here. Um, so it was uh, from Tristram in the UK. So he says, as well as rewilding land and water, we see a lot out there about rewilding ourselves, our lives, society, etc. I mean, is, is that this so-called human rewilding a totally separate thing to rewilding of nature or are they connected in some way? Well, it's interesting. They're certainly connected conceptually. And um, I'm, this is why I think it's an interesting topic to talk about because people use that idea of rewilding themselves. I think it, it shows what they think is important about the wild. And um, uh, I think um, getting in touch with more uh, authentic experiences rather than trying to uh, adjust yourself to the expectations of others, um, reconnecting to sort of fundamental sensory experiences as opposed to having everything maybe mediated through technology. So, um, you know, at, at a surface level, they're very different things, but I think at a, at a more abstract conceptual level, they do have some things in common. And I haven't seen any interest any research in this, but it would be interesting to see if people, um, you know, exposure to wild spaces helped people rewild themselves. And I, I think that there would be um, some reason to think that, well, there's certainly uh, some reason to think that that might happen. Cool, thanks very much for that, that's great. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, from, uh, let's see, from Joanna and from Katie, which I'm going to merge. So uh, they're along the lines of, actually, I'm not going to do that at all, but that's, I'm talking rubbish here. I'm going to, I'm going to just do the one from Joanna first. So uh, I'll, I'll point at Natalie, I think. How far back should we be looking when talking about rewild in the UK? So this is the idea of returning back to the days when the wild boar roamed in herds, back to bears. Should we and should we retain habitats which have been created by humans, such as heaths, or should we let nature set the agenda? That's multiple questions in one. 
So I'm the wrong one to answer because I'm not the, the the one that will preach to go back in time. Um, I mean, we are just about to face an enormous, we are facing an enormous climate change crisis. It's just to think that we're going to go back in time to where we were. It's just, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's reasonable. So I think to me, um, a colleague of mine came up with this really nice, um, with this really nice analogy of what rewilding is. And he said, it's like a, a Cuban car. You know, it can have a piece from here and some tires from there, some, some stuff from it, whatever it comes from. But the point is that it works. <laughs> it's a car, it gets you from A to B. And I think that's, that's, that's how I would think about it, which is basically making those ecosystem work in whatever way is possible, given all the changes that we are, that we're experiencing. And given also what people are prepared to live with. Because ecosystem are part of socio-ecological system, people live by, they need to be on board with that. So it might be in some places, they might be super happy to have big herbivore, big carnivore and stuff, et cetera, and let's go for it. And in other places, they might choose to do something else. So it's a combination of what's possible given where we're going trajectory-wise on climate change and what people are prepared to live with and, and be on board with. Many thanks, I think. Jens, you've got something to say? Yes, yes, I, I do. I've been thinking a lot about this, and I should say I, I have a very particular interest in, in long-term perspectives, both in the past and in the future. Um, and I, actually, I mean, I don't disagree with it really with what, what Natalie says, but I, I do think that it's important to, to look back to understand our biodiversity and especially to understand all the species that are in trouble, basically, because it's easy enough to make space for the common species that do well in our landscapes now if we just give them a little bit of room. But there's a lot of species that do very badly in our current landscapes in, in, in Europe, for example, especially in Western Europe. So to understand them, we do have to look, look back. And, and back for me fits perfectly well looking into the future with climate change and so on, because back is not like to a specific time, it's looking at the general conditions that made it possible for our biodiversity to arise and allowed our species, our current species, to, to live and be maintained for hundreds of thousands of years. As I mentioned before, most of our macroscopic species are super old, so they have lived through lots of climate change and most, most of the species that you have now in, in England as, as macroscopic species, they have most of the time not lived in England. They've been out of England because the climate was too cold and too dry sometimes even. So, so I think we can learn a lot from looking back, but not for reconstructing, but for understanding these general kinds of conditions that have allowed our biodiversity to arise and also the particular needs of the species that are in trouble nowadays. Um, and I also think it can help us avoid what's called the shifting baseline syndrome. And that's setting the bar too low in our ambitions for biodiversity. To say we, it, it, the, the, the notion is that, that you set the baseline basically to how things were when you were a kid or at least something like that, that you can remember. And the thing is that with on, ongoing environmental degradation, we just get used to satisfied with things that are already super degraded. So I think looking beyond that can help us see, okay, it could be better than that. It could be much better than that even. And so we can learn from that, but not really as a reconstruction exercise, but to not set the bar too low and to understand what are really the factors that can maintain biodiversity in the long run. Many thanks, Jens. Uh, Natalie, I think you've got a response. It's just to reply on this, to, to unphase again that rewilding is not about just species, it's about ecosystem and it's, it's, so it's, it's about how things work together. Um, so looking at this by trying to mix up the message between species conservation and which species is doing bad or not bad with rewilding is potentially not working really well. 
because it's going to completely remove possibility opportunity offered by other species that have similar ecological role to play a part in making a, a, an ecosystem more functional. And so th not that I disagree about the ability to learn from the past, etc. But I think it's a little bit like uh, those climate prediction. You look at the past to try to make your prediction, but you also know that there's huge uncertainty because we've never faced that before. And I think we're also in those contexts right now, biodiversity wise. So um, the, there's there's tension between ecosystem um, management and species management in rewilding. And I think those tension at some point will need to be addressed. Um, but likewise, there's also tension between those historic back, historical baseline and whether or not they are useful to set a uh, trajectory and target for rewilding. And that I think it will be very much context dependent because ultimately what will matter is the community and whether they are prepared to live with that. Many thanks, Natalie. So um, that's great. I'm going to um, pass on to the land land ownership issues really. So um, maybe focus uh, you, Kim, here. So Emma from the Wildcard campaign group says, um, a shift away from animal agriculture is clearly necessary to undertake significant rewilding in the UK, probably elsewhere. How can we ensure there's mutual benefit for farmers and landowners alongside nature? That's a biggie, Kim. So yeah, it's a big question. I think it's yeah. something which is being thrashed out at the minute. So we're moving from um, tax payments, so European substitutes for farm uh, landowners, for example, towards a different type of payment for the environmental land management scheme, which is paying par uh, farmers in a different way to, their, to the ways they would have been done previously. And part of that movement, and this is why I say different agendas are now getting involved in the rewilding movement, is a push towards um, those, some of those payments being towards rewilding your land or thinking about paying farmers for, or landowners for allowing areas of their land to rewild. So these could be strategies for um, kind of encouraging landowners who might have previously um, been uh, kind of animal owning farmers or have livestock agriculture, for example, to transition to rewilding. It's called agri rewilding. So there's different forms of re another form of rewilding, agri rewilding. Um, so there are people out there doing that at the moment, and then there are there's kind of the broad brush farmers where there is this currently being thrashed out in Westminster and in, on the ground as well as to kind of what's acceptable um, to landowners and farmers on the ground. Um, part of this problem is it's kind of the monetization of rewilding then. So we go back to using rewilding essentially as a form of ecosystem service or becoming an ecosystem service provider. That's fine. And it, again, you know, it fits with our structure of society very well. But for people who are interested in Extinction Rebellion, for example, um, you know, one of the key aspects of Extinction Rebellion is actually thinking of a way to structure our society differently, which doesn't revolve around the global um, economy or the political economy that we have now. And payment for ecosystem services is not a good way to do that. Um, so these are all big questions, which I don't have the answer to, and I don't think anyone has the answer to right now, but are being hotly debated, um, you know, in Westminster and across the academic community as well as on, on the land itself. Many thanks, Kim, for dealing with that. That's, it has a very fraught issue, so thanks very much for those, those responses. I'm going to point this next question at Susan, and it's maybe phrased rather oddly, but hopefully you get the idea behind it. <laughs> so Edward says, what if my child gets attacked by a wolf? I guess I was giving that to you as a sort of more idea about, you know, what about the disbenefits or the dangers of wild nature? Yeah, that is a very fair question. And uh, I think we need to grapple with that in, uh, in all kinds of domains that, um, you know, one very academic sounding answer is that uh, to think about people's perceptions of risk. And um, although in the long run, risk may be reduced by having more interaction with wild species. And I can't, I can't think of a particular example of why that would work right now, but, um, uh, but I'm sure that there are some. Uh, nevertheless, the one attack by a wild animal is going to loom much larger in the person's mind. And uh, so we need to 
um, we need to respect people's fears along those lines and um, give them some information about ways to protect themselves, um, but also give them a sense of, of why to, you know, why it's worth having this risk, even if it's a very small one, um, as opposed to, you know, having a, a world in which it would be impossible for your child to be attacked by a wild animal. So um, it's giving rational information about what are the real risks, but it's also respecting that people's risks are not perfectly rational and there's a very powerful emotional component and um, the thought of having your child attacked by a wild animal is about as emotional as we can get. Great thanks for that Susan that stimulated others so I think Natalie you had your hand up first. Yeah, I think, I think it's really important to acknowledge that there will be risk with rewilding. I mean, if you take the example of the UK, unmanaged area might be prone to have more uh, ticks, which means more disease, might be more uh, mosquitoes, which also might bring some more disease. So there will be a lot of things that will pose a challenge. And but I think that's exactly why rewilding should never, ever be considered before addressing the community nearby and together seeing whether they are up for it, discussing transparently all the risk, trying to see how people are prepared to move with that, discuss the positive and the benefits, and really think about those uh, equity in terms of distribution of benefits, and then move together forward. As soon as you're going to impose something on the community, including those, uh, those uh, risks, this, this is, is a recipe for disaster, basically. Many thanks. Kim? Over to you. Yeah, just to again emphasize the community aspect. So it's really important that rewilding isn't done to communities, but also that there's, it's not just lip service in the consultation process, as we have seen in some of the rewilding um, across Britain at, at the, you know, various organizations. What there needs to be is a kind of a real engaged participatory approach to designing rewilding in communities. An approach which genuinely and sincerely enrolls people in the design of the design of the initiative itself and does all those other things that Natalie says they do, you know, you know, have ecologists and scientists go in there to, to talk about the risk and actually the real risk itself. Um, but the second point is um, rewilding is going to be about learning to live with nature again, skills that we've lost over the last 50, 60 or so years. Um, and that's a slow process and it will involve working with experts, perhaps experts outside of academia who live on the land and know the land well. And, uh, you know, that's something which will need to take place if we're going to live and adapt with nature. And the final point there is wolves. We always hear about wolves uh, with rewilding. And there is this huge focus and there, there has been ever since, you know, feral came out. Um, in the media around, around wolves and you know the, the fear of wolves and actually I think we need to move the narrative away from that because that's quite far removed from what rewilding is particularly in Britain I know in Europe it's um, slightly different uh, context but actually rewilding isn't about wolves it's a small element of, of that uh, kind of larger idea of what rewilding is and so actually we need to push back against the media with the, the idea that wolves are coming in to eat us up um, because it's it's really not the case and when it does get to that point which is much much further down the line if you talk to various stakeholders there's no chance that wolves are going to be reintroduced yeah, at, at any time soon we're going to move towards that very slowly as we learn to live with nature um, and hopefully by that point we have a better understanding of what we need to do to adapt many thanks and just before i pass to Jens, just to warn panelists that i'm going to then ask you to do your wrap up comments so scribble your notes down now so Jens I think you had something to say about wolves or similar yes and also that so so first of all I would say it's one of, I mean my my family or part of my family also comes from an island I love islands but it, when speaking about wolves I'm really happy to live in Jutland in Denmark which is a peninsula in continental Europe because it means that we actually have wolves in the in Jutland now and we've had it since 2012 we have we have breeding wolves it's been and the landscape here is like england so it's not we don't have any wilderness or anything like that so it's possible it's not uncontroversial i would be strongly lying if i said that it wasn't controversial but it's possible uh, and i'm hopeful that we will have wolves for in the long run and maybe and more than we have now 
Um, so I'm glad that we are part of the continent for that reason, because I think they would never be, at least not in my lifetime, be reintroduced. So, so we are lucky there. Just the other thing I would say, I think it is important to work on, on, on knowledge, on risks, so that we can evaluate risks. I would say I'm nervous when my kids go downtown, my kids are, are big, when they go out at night, uh, downtown Aarhus, which is a safe city, I should say, I'm still a bit nervous about that. If they go driving on the highway, they are still young drivers. I'm a bit nervous about that. I would never be nervous for them to go to one of our rewilding areas here in Denmark or to the to the forest in with Western Jutland where we have the wolves, because I know the risk is so much smaller. So I do think we have to work on these things to 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 be informed in our risk assessment, but of course not but of course respecting how people view these things. Many thanks. Um, that's great. So yeah, let's have, uh, we'll go around and have some wrap up comments. So uh, Natalie, go with you first. <laughs> um, so my wrap up comments. Um, last year, the IUCN adopted a motion on a rewilding that has now become a, re a resolution. Um, there will be a working group, an enormous amount of consultation. Uh, to uh, prepare guidelines to inform the IUCN on how to deal with rewilding. And my, my uh, close-up comment would be for anyone interested to engage with that, because I do think that uh, you should never leave those kind of problems to scientists alone. Um, you should have the whole community to come together to make a plan for how this could work in reality in various community and localities. Um, so I'm hoping that people will engage with that process uh, to try to make it um, more common, um, as we were discussing before, we still have not that many uh, places where we can learn from uh, rewilding and how it works, and also more acceptable. So putting in place frameworks and uh, uh, ways to get people on board to move forward. So yeah, and this IUCN consultation, I think, will be a, a, an important step stone to try to move a scientist and practitioner towards a, a common understanding uh, for implementation. Many thanks, Natalie. Um, I'll pass over to Susan now. Thanks. Well, I was just thinking about, um, you know, rewilding, I think, involves three major challenges, all of which, all of which are, are, are difficult. Um, one is that we spend a lot of time talking about today is just what is it trying to achieve? You know, what does it mean to engage in rewilding? And I, I, I think that emphasis on or that recognition that it's not a particular state, um, it's, especially it's not a return to a particular state, but it's a, um, it's a process. It's trying to achieve a certain kind of ongoing process. And that, that makes it difficult um, to get, move on to the next challenge, which is how do you get to it? Um, and that's very much a, you know, a question for the ecologists and the, and the biologists to answer. Um, but the third major challenge is how can you get people to be comfortable with it? Um, something else we've talked a lot about today. And I think uh, we, we need to recognize that that's as significant as the other two challenges, but also um, recognize that, you know, there's variability. People don't Obviously not everybody hates wolves and not everybody welcomes wolves. Um, and part of that variability is, uh, is culturally specific. So what have we learned about the significance and importance and value of nature? And that's uh, a challenge that we can do more as a society to address. And then the other, um, the other point about that is that people can be, they can be swayed, they can be convinced. And so thinking about, um, uh, involving them. So not just convincing them, but, but working with them as Kim has been saying and Natalie has been saying to, um, but uh, stressing the values, highlighting the values that are important to them and recognizing the vast range of values that nature might provide to humans and not just uh, focusing on, on a fairly, on a, a description of nature that leaves humans out of the picture, but acknowledging all of those benefits um, that can come from giving humans the opportunity to, to be a part of, uh, of the natural ecosystem. Great, thanks for that, Susan. Um, Jens, we'll go to you next. Thank you, James. Yeah, it's, it, there are many things to say. I, I, would, I would say, I was just thinking now, not about 
Earth, but about Mars. So we're very obsessed about going to Mars. I'm also myself fascinated about that. But thinking about that, I, I always come back to Earth and think about what makes Earth a fantastic place to live. It's because it's a living planet. It's a biodiverse planet. It has this richness of life. And at the same time now, we are facing a severe biodiversity crisis. It cannot be understated or overstated, I should say, sorry, how strong that is. And we do, and I do, and I, we, we are not investing nearly enough efforts on overcoming this biodiversity crisis. I mean, there's a lot of talk, there's actions going on, but we're, we are not addressing it in any way that's really sufficient yet. And I do see rewilding as having the potential to play a very big role in overcoming the biodiversity crisis. And I, that's really, for me, the core. At the same time, I do see also benefits for, for maintaining resilient ecosystems in facing climate change and the services that people, to some extent, depend on, and of course, for quality of life for people. But really, I see rewilding as super central to overcoming this biodiversity crisis and maintaining this fantastic richness of life on Earth. Many thanks, Jens. And last, but by no means least, Kim. I get the final comment. Um, so I would say I absolutely agree with what the other panelists have finished on, but also to say that we're at a crossroads at the minute, I think. And the crossroads is rewilding can be a really hopeful narrative it can be a really hopeful thing that we could do in the world to you know restoring system function um, but in order for that to happen it has to be aligned with a, a more hopeful political structure as well so we're at this crossroads where rewilding potentially could be co-opted into a traditional conservation model um, or fall more broadly in the natural capital um, in policy circles and as Natalie said Let's not leave the debate around rewilding to scientists. Let's not leave it to policymakers as well. Let's get informed and let's help make decisions around how we want to do rewilding and what that looks like. Is it an elite endeavor? Is it an endeavor that is structured around um, the political economy? Or is it an alternative vision for the world, not just the ecology of the world, but actually the world itself? And the final thing is, we're gonna have to live in a messier world if we wanna rewild in this way. So as you're walking down the street, as you're in your garden, start to think about how you're going to live with that, that messiness and decay and start learning to live with wild nature. Cool. Thanks very much, Kim, and thanks everyone else. So we're going to draw it to a close here. Um, I thanks all the listeners and watchers today and for all the questions you posed. And sorry we haven't been able to address all of them, but I hope you address the essence of most of the questions. And I'd like to thank all the panelists for their, you know, giving up, well, giving up their evenings or their mornings, depending on where they are. Um, and so uh, I guess it remains for me to say thanks, Kim, thanks, Susan, thanks, Natalie, and thanks, Jens. And thanks to all our listeners, and bye-bye. <laughs>